good to be with you, friends, uh, one more time before we go our different ways. But we've been meeting punctually every week for the last six months. And now we've come to the culmination of this season of these gatherings. Over these months we have studied nature. We have investigated the beauty and power that is in nature and found that rather than mere randomness, there pervades the earth and the solar system and the universe a tremendous meaningfulness, a light of intelligence that shows itself in the arrangement of the stars and planets, in the rhythms of the tides, in the migratory instincts of birds, and in our own humanity. In the depths of who we are, this light of intelligence finds its fullness in the awakened beings, in souls who accommodate in their hearts the vastness of this whole creation. Beings who are moved by unconditional love and guided by signs that dawn on the faculty of intuition rather than merely reacting to circumstances according to conditioning and the tendency to fear what is to come. Those beings who awaken to love, awaken to guidance, and become themselves the guides on the path that is leading us all home, step by step. If we only knew we are home now, but we're so lost in distraction, it's only by the help of beings who have awakened to divinity that we begin ourselves to awaken. These beings are pole stars. They are envoys from the depths of being. They're ones without whom this whole world would crumble to dust and all hope would be lost. But we have hope and we have faith because of the holy prophets, the sages of all lands and all times. These are beings who have become more than separate selves, more than just egos. They have been become part of what we call the spirit of guidance. That great field, that great matrix whereby the divine guidance is given to this world. 
like a thread on which are strung many beads. The spirit of guidance works through many souls, encompasses all souls in their awakening, and is personified in the figure of the messenger, who is united with all beings awakening to the luminous divine inheritance that has been breathed into our beings. This matrix of illumination has been known to many spiritual traditions by many different names. Hindus speak of Hiranya Garbha, golden embryo. Buddha speak of Tathagata Garbha, the embryonic Buddha. The practitioners of Mazda Yasna and who follow Zarathustra speak of the good mind, Vohu Mana, inspiriting good thought in all beings. Among the Jewish people, mention is made of Chokmah or Sophia and Shakina the Divine Presence descending to the earth, inhabiting the world and imparting tranquility. The Verus Propheta, the true prophet, is a name given to this one prophet appearing in the figures of so many prophets among the Gnostic Christians, and Christos, the Christ, bespeaks this universal guiding spirit, recognized by the Muslims as the Nuri Muhammadi. All of these names designating one field, one matrix of guidance. And the whole of history is manifesting what this prophetic light has received from God. Amushid Hazrat Pir Amushid in Ait Khan says, A Sufi considers all prophets and sages not as many individuals, but as the one embodiment of God's pure consciousness or the manifestation of divine wisdom appearing on earth for the awakening of humanity from the sleep of ignorance in different names and forms. And one of Mushid's uh, Khalifa's Nargis Doland said, the body of the master if one can use such a term, magnetic field would better express it, is composed of the perfected souls of those beings who in every age since the beginning of this earth have reached the stage of evolution known to mystics as perfection. The accumulated souls of all those who are working for a higher purpose illuminated by the source, not merely involved in the motives that spring from a personal ego, separate from others, separate from the totality, but those who awaken from that limitation to perfection, who become vessels 
will become instruments. The totality of, of these instruments, the totality of awakening beings constituting a constellation, the spirit of guidance manifesting through the prophets, a luminous reality. The prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, the first thing God created was my light. The first thing God created was my light. In the book of Genesis we read, God commenced creation with the words, let there be light. The origin of nature is this primal light of guidance from which all has come. The sun at the dawn of creation. The Quran Sharif refers to the Prophet as a Sarajan Munir, a radiant lamp, resplendent with illumination. The Prophet is also a figure of limitless compassion. Light becomes synonymous with that knowing that is inseparable from affection, care, concern. To truly know something, anything, is to, to love it, because this whole creation has been made of the divine love. And so the luminous intelligence of the Prophet is a form of compassion. And the Quran Sharif says, Have we not sent you except as a mercy to all worlds? Rahmatan lil alameen. A mercy, a rahmah, to all worlds. Not only to one particular religious community, not to one race, not to one nation, not to one species. Not to one world, but to all worlds. Such is the nature of the compassionate, blazing light of the Prophet. It is for all, indiscriminately. Just as the light of the sun, as it shines on the earth, is not only for the rich and not the poor, not for people of one skin color and not another skin color, not for people of one faith or another. So the prophet, every prophet, is for us all. And such is the compassion of the prophet that, as Abul Hassan Kharqani said, Whoever passes a day without harming anyone, it is as, as if he spent that day with the Prophet. So the less one causes harm, the most harmless one becomes, the closer one comes to the Prophet. And if one wishes to be in the prophetic company, then harmlessness is the way. And of course the contemplation of harmlessness is a profound subject that can lead us into ever finer nuances of respect, understanding, sympathy, vigilance. And with these qualities inevitably comes the quality of beauty. And the Prophet exemplifies uh, beauty to the utmost. One of the great Prophets of this world, Joseph, Yusuf salam, was the Prophet of beauty par excellence. The 
the prophet who, for whom beauty was his primary means of dispensing the divine guidance. But there is beauty in all of the prophets and in the spirit of guidance, in the fullness of the inner being of the messenger is the, the complete beauty of the insan al-kamil, of the complete human being. The Qur'an Sharif describes the Prophet as a beautiful archetype, uswa hasana, a beautiful archetype. And an archetype is a template toward which to aspire. It's as though looking into a mirror and seeing a potentiality in one's own inner being that one has forgotten. When we are in the presence of what is majestic and beautiful, then we are reminded of something we have too long forgotten and lifted up toward it. And then we strive to, to emulate the beauty we have discovered, to walk in its light and, as far as possible, exist within its sphere. And therefore the prophets, all of them, have beautified this world and have evoked in generation after generation that, that devotion, that nostalgia, that aspiration that conjures up the beauty that was seeded in us, that was blown into us at the beginning of time, that ancient inheritance. The prophets, the prophetesses, the saints, the masters, the sages, they all together take care of this world. This world is in the care of those who do not serve themselves. All too often when we look at the news, we see evidence of all kinds of self-serving agendas. And it would be very easy to become cynical and, and depressed. But if we can look deeper, look further, we will find there are always those who are part of what is called the spiritual government of the world, the Diwan or the cloud of witnesses that collective of awakened and awakening beings who are pledging themselves, who have pledged themselves to the divine service by serving creation. And they are arranged in various roles of service. There's the, the peer who works with individuals the Buzurg, who uses soul power to inspire, the Wali, who helps to heal and protect a community, the Ghaus, who is responsible for a whole region, the Qutub, in whose care is a whole country, the Nabi, whose work is still vaster, and ultimately the Rasul, the, the Rasul who is entrusted with the spiritual responsibility for the whole world and beyond, in the invisible and invisible spheres. Among these holy beings, some 
are called saints, some are called masters. The saints are the ones who are aligned with the Jamali qualities. The ones who are called masters are aligned with the Jalali qualities. But the Rasul combines Jalal and Jamal in Kamal in that perfect balance. And the whole cloud of witnesses, the whole Divan, ultimately integrates all of the divine names and manifests them through the human condition. Now you might say, one hears very much of men among the prophets and saints and masters, are there not women also? Certainly there are. How can we doubt it when both men and women are divinely created forms of humanity? In the Sanatana Dharma of India, there are female Avatars. Avatar is the name of a guiding light among the Hindus, and there are women avatars as there are men. In Buddhism, the figure of Tara, the Bodhisattva Tara. I remember many years ago, I heard a Lama say that to be to become a bodhisattva, one, one must be a man. Only men are bodhisattvas. And I had the wonderful chance of speaking with um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and asked, is it, is it so that only men uh, may be bodhisattvas? And he answered, that was true until Tara. And then he let out a great bellowing laugh, and he said, Tara is the world's first feminist. In the Hebrew Bible, there are five figures known um, as prophets, Isaiah's wife, Hulda, Nodia, Miriam, and Deborah, and the many um, exegetes who suspect that there are many other among the women of the Bible as well to be counted as prophetesses. And in the Islamic tradition, uh, Ibn Hazm recognizes the figures of Sarah and uh, Maryam as prophetesses. So among the great beings, among the illuminated souls of all lands, of all times, there have been leading lights, there have been illuminators of this world among men and women, people of different races, people of different lands, speaking different languages, and all transmitting that um, that ancient light, which is the, the the spirit of guidance, and it's it's in all of us, it's in all of us. But there are those beings who so fully receive it and awaken to it uh, that their entire life now is aligned to the sacred service for which humanity was created. But it's not only humanity, because among the animals too are guiding lights. Moshe says not only human beings, but animals, birds, insects, trees, and plants all have a spiritual attainment. They have their epiphanies and reveries and 
rendings of the veil and discoveries of the divine presence. They have their acts of glorification and exaltation. And there are among them the holy ones who are a light to the others as we find in the Jataka tales, for instance, as our Pirzadi Shahida Nur told them. The great monkey king, for instance, who saved so many of his fellows by an act of self-sacrifice. And the human uh, prophets and sages have always stayed so close to nature and nature has always answered them. Think of the oak of Abraham, the oak under which Ibrahim alayhi salam, Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, God bless and keep them, that holy oak under which they sat, and the Bodhi tree under which the Buddha sat. Think of Sita, who even in her imprisonment was surrounded by green things and flowers because her atmosphere produced viridity. And uh, the companions of Rama, Hanuman and Sugriva, the monkeys, and Jambavan, the bear, the animals come to the aid of those who serve the holy cause. They are allies in the great cause of the divine revelation. The prophet Daniel in the lion's den wasn't torn to shreds because the lions recognized the prophetic light in him. All of nature sees it because it's at the very root of nature. Kwajakizar, the green man, where he walks, flowers bloom and all is green. There's a lushness that follows him. His touch is the touch of water and fish are quickened in his presence. And the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when he fled his enemies and was traveling towards Medina, and was pursued by those who meant to take his life. And he secreted himself in a, in a cave. His pursuers found the cave and they would have in the night gone in and taken his life, but that a spider weaved a web at the entrance of the cave and a dove made its nest there. And so the prophet was protected because all of nature harmonizes with the one who brings the message because the message bespeaks the harmony of all of nature. How do we approach the messenger? How do we near this light, the three steps as taught in the Sufi path, Fanafi Sheikh, Fanafi Rasul, and at last Fanafi Allah. And these steps represent first concentration, then contemplation, and then meditation. Concentration is fanafi sheikh. It means coming to know a guide in the path, a living human being like yourself who has all of the same 
struggles that you have, the same limitations, but has, who has learned to live in this world in a blessed manner, and ca who can remind you and teach you what you have forgotten or neglected. This is Fanafi Sheikh to establish a heart-to-heart -heart connection of guidance and to be uplifted by the company of someone who is immersed in sacred remembrance. This is concentration, but the next step is contemplation. And this is when one is no longer in the presence of one's guide, and one doesn't anymore need exclusively the, the contact with the guide. One can experience guidance from nature itself, from the depths of being, from one's own innermost depths, through the ideal, which is the spirit of guidance itself, which is that same current of guidance which manifests through all of the holy prophets and prophetesses and saints and masters. One communes with that source through devotion. First, one needed the outer form of the teacher, but now the qualities themselves burgeon and coalesce as a crystallization of all of the holy beings. And that presence is always present. And that is Fanafi Rasul. And the spirit of the Rasul then ushers the soul to that horizon which is infinite and eternal, where all names and forms dissolve away, and all is as it ever was and always will be within the divine perfection that has no end. Therefore, Sayyid Zil Hassan Jili Kalimi wrote these words in Urdu. Hey Tariqa Sahel, me ketahu goshi dil sun, pele khod ko shekar, Firho Muhammad Mustafa. He Muhammad Abdiat ka bas maqam. Usko bi chor. Aage tuj se kya kaho. Khod raaz e haq kul jayega. The path is simple, I say. Open your heart's ear. First make yourself the teacher. Then become the prophet. Muhammad is the station of servanthood. Leave that too. Beyond that, what can I say? God's own secret will be revealed. Mm -hmm.